Remember when we used to go out to parties? It's hard to remember, but back before the pandemic, this time of year, we used to go to office parties, we used to watch football games at our friend's house, and don't forget the New Year's Eve bash. It was a time before the six feet apart rule. Can you believe that there was a time when we used to reach out and give each other hugs and handshakes? Then, after our brief embrace, we would retreat roughly two feet apart to what we used to call, air quotes, personal space. And if you're, let's say, Greek, Italian, or Cuban, like me, there was no such thing as personal space. Prior to COVID-19, we would just pucker up our lips with our bare face and give each other a big wet smack on the cheek. Maybe two cheeks, if we really liked you. Parties were great. The music was always a little too loud. Remember all the small talk? People would just lean in close to you and talk really loudly spraying all kinds of germs on your exposed face. And we always knew just what to do when the small talk lasted a little too long. Remember that thing you used to say to get out of conversations? Ah, those were the days. And the buffalo chicken dip. Oh, the buffalo chicken dip. God knows how many people dipped right before you. Or that cough or the sneeze that you never noticed before, but now it makes your heart stop. Good times, good times indeed. Well, since you really can't go to parties anymore, this New Year's Eve, we're going to celebrate together. Today, we're talking about party crashers. Our first story is about the art of crashing a party. How do you attend a party you weren't invited to without getting caught? Our second story is the greatest party crashing story of all time. And we'll wrap up the show with stories from listeners like you. I asked you guys to submit stories about a time where you crashed a party. And boy, did you have a lot to say. Oh, and by the way, some parts in this episode are not suitable for young children, so just wanted to throw that out there. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. One evening, I was hanging out with my friends Jason and Megan Gilligan. Megan is a wedding planner, and she's also the host of the wedding planning podcast called Weddings For Real. Megan mentioned to me that she was going to go check out a new wedding venue, and she asked me if I wanted to tag along, but I wasn't even invited. And this event is strictly for wedding planners. But what the hell, right? Who needs an invitation when you're doing an episode about party crashing? How's it going? How's it going? Where are we right now? <laughs> Who is this? Where, where? We're at an open house for a brand new venue that just opened up, and you are crashing it right now. I know. I am totally crashing a wedding event party. Are you trying to get a free drink? Is that why you're trying to crash parties? Free drinks. You can get buffalo chicken egg rolls. You can get cake. So many good things. Yeah. So you know why I'm here? Why? Because buffalo chicken egg rolls. <laughs> <laughs> chicken egg rolls? Yes, buffalo chicken egg rolls. Okay, those the, are so good. That's the second reason why I'm here. But like the first, first reason why I'm here is because yeah. I actually want pointers on how to crash a party. Love it. Well, number one is attire. Yeah, a thousand attire. percent. You, you have to be on like point. Yes, dress like the guest. Number two is confidence. You can look like you're not supposed to be there. You yeah. walk in, you go up to someone, you make small talk. If you're being a loner in the corner, absolutely, somebody will suspect it. I don't know what kind of party I should crash. Like, you think a wedding is too big of a party for me to crash right now? As a wedding planner, I have to say yes. Like, should I start small, like a little kid's, small. like a little kid's birthday party? Be very creepy. Maybe avoid children. <laughs> okay. Like a sweet sixteen, possibly, like bar mitzvah. I think I might stand up. I have to stop and describe this event for you. It's a wedding venue, so it looks and feels like a real wedding. The place was huge. Throughout the venue, each vendor had their own setup. There was a photography section, 
and a table with cake samples. Caterers were passing around hors d'oeuvres, and the DJ was blasting music. I quickly realized that a bumping party isn't exactly the best place to record interviews. So I went searching for a quiet place to record. I walked into the room where the bride hides to do her makeup. That's when I ran into Nina McCaskey, who runs a hair and makeup business. All right. So do you know why I'm here? No. Because I want to crash a wedding party. Ooh, that sounds fun. And I need some tips. And so I'm crashing this event so that I can learn tips from you on how to crash a party. So here's what I want to know. I need to crash a party. And I was I was wondering, should I go big or should I go small? Should I start like at a small party or should I go to a big, big wedding like, like this one? I feel like a bigger one would be better because you'd blend in more than if it was a smaller group. Somebody would be like, who's that guy? Like no one knows him. And, and when I get there, should I, should I be the life of the party or should I blend in? Like, should I be a wallflower? I wouldn't, I would just be like medium. Do you know what I mean? Just hang out, ask people thoughtful questions, dress nice. I wouldn't get too drunk and I wouldn't like dance too hard because then everyone will be like, who's that drunk guy? Here's here's my fear, right? Because I don't like breaking the law and stuff like that. Usually I'm interviewing the criminals. <laughs> I'm not usually the criminal in the story. But what if somebody asked me why I'm there? I don't want to lie. I don't want to lie. What do I tell them? Just say, I'm so excited for the happy couple. Don't they look amazing? And uh, are you with the bride or the groom? Say, I'm with both. They're incredible. Here's another thing. I should buy a gift, right, for the... No, that's super weird. <laughs> but I'm crashing their wedding. I would have an envelope and put their name on it with nothing in it. <laughs> so no gift, because that's creepy. Yeah. All right, but I thought, well, I'm going to- the envelope the is good. so funny. <laughs> Nina offered some good tips. She gave me the confidence that even I could pull this off. So I put down the microphone to avoid any unwanted attention. Plus, ditching the microphone freed up my hands to make room for a glass of champagne and a plate of buffalo chicken wontons. When the night was over, my friend Megan and I walked back to our cars. She's the real expert. Megan has helped brides organize a bajillion weddings, and she has her own wedding planning podcast. If anyone knows how to spot a party crasher, it's her. So Megan, I want to crash a party, okay. and I couldn't think of a better person to ask for advice than you, because you have the Weddings for Real podcast, and you're an expert at weddings, so you should know weddings inside and out. So I've had a wedding and event planning business for nine years now, and it's so easy to spot a wedding crasher when they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and that's exactly what I don't want to f find myself in a situation where I'm spotted or I'm outed. What do I do? Okay, number one, you have to be confident. Normally, I can spot a wedding crasher because they look very confused and very concerned about where they are. So going in with confidence. Number two, I would say as soon as you get into the space, look around for names, whether it's on the bar or a welcome sign. You have to look for the names because then you can address the couple as Alicia and Joe or Sarah and John. But you have to know names so that you can converse with the guests around you. Oh, wait a minute. So I have to probably do some homework. I didn't even think about this because I'm thinking in my head that I need to show up at a popular wedding venue. But should I go to the ceremony or should I just show up at the reception? I think if you just show up at the reception, people have kind of got their eye on you. I know I do, where I'm like, I didn't see this guy at the ceremony. Is he a legit guest? But if you show up at the ceremony, I feel that you're fully invested at that point. So ceremony is key to get to the reception where the free food and drinks are. Ooh. <laughs> but what if it's like a Catholic wedding? I mean, those, those are long weddings. Well, I need to know your level of commitment to the wedding crashing. And if you're not okay with an hour long ceremony, then maybe you shouldn't be there. I'm a busy guy. <laughs> this is all great advice, but maybe you need a little bit more help. Don't worry, there's an app for that. You know you make me wanna Free food, free drinks, and the possibility of a one night stand. It's what this country was built on. It's not developed yet, but there's an app called Crash Corsage that arms you with the intel you need to crash a party. Here's a clip of their demo. At least it's what Crash Corsage 
the world's first wedding crashing app was built for. Crash Corsage is a utility that allows anybody, anywhere, to crash a wedding. Here's how it works. Many couples register on websites like The Knot and TheWeddingChannel.com. These couples don't realize it, but they're handing over a party crasher everything they need to know about their upcoming wedding. How the couple met. Who popped the question. Where and when are they going to get married. It's a gold mine of information. The app, Crash Corsage, searches these databases and makes everything searchable. With Crash Corsage, you'll know which weddings are nearby, what you'll need to wear, and when they're kicking off. Choose a wedding to learn about the couple and festivities. The content is brought in dynamically to create the ultimate cheat sheet of background info. Here's the best part about the app. The more parties you crash, the more points you get. Limbo contests, heartfelt speeches, and of course, coital encounters with guests. Take pictures to prove your chops and see how you measure up against others. It's more than a crash course in wedding crashing. It's Crash Corsage. Fortunately for all of us, this app is not available. Thank God. When we come back, I'm going to interview a party crasher who fooled the Secret Service. Oh, you'll want to hear this. While working on this episode, I started wondering, what is the biggest party ever crashed? The date was November 24th, 2009. Two Washington, D.C. socialites were on their way to the White House state dinner for the Indian Prime Minister Mon Mahan Singh. We are going to the state dinner. Yes! The voice you're hearing is Mikhail Salahi. She's riding in a limo dressed in a red sari. You know, the traditional Indian garb. Beside her is her husband, Tariq Salahi. He's dressed in a tux. The Salahis are the stars of the popular Bravo reality TV show, The Real Housewives of D.C. And tonight, they plan to crash the White House state dinner. This is the dinner of the year. The whole world tries to come to this event, so people of the highest order are turned away. I mean, former presidents are turned away. Everyone gets turned away because if you don't have an invite, there's no way in hell that you're going to get past the Secret Service. I mean, come on, it's the White House. The Salahis go over their plan one last time before they pull up to the gate. We have our IDs. Yep. The uh, camera. Got the camera, you give it to me. We'll leave my phone. The less yeah, badges and things we have, the easier it'll be with the check-in. This plan is insane. Do they really think that they can just waltz into the most secure place on Earth? Yeah, right. They're not even invited. The guests are handpicked by the president and the first lady. They include ambassadors, diplomats, members of Congress, and A-list celebrities. And somehow, these D-list celebrities plan to get in on the action. I might ask for one or two pictures. I know they said not many hugs or no hugging. <laughs> Once you're done yeah. through the receiving line, you can be right. a little bit more relaxed. When we get in, you... Yeah. Hold up. Beep, beep, beep. Let's back up here and talk about how big of a deal this is. A state dinner is a banquet that's held in honor of a foreign head of state. This year's guest of honor was the Prime Minister of India. Events like these follow strict protocols to ensure everything runs smoothly. Every little detail is obsessed over. The White House executive chef is in charge of the five-course meal. The White House floral designer arranges the flowers and the decorations on the candlelit table. Even the White House calligrapher creates handwritten place cards for each guest. Before dinner even begins, there's a state arrival ceremony. The Indian head of state arrives in a motorcade from the Blair House, which is the official guest quarters. Then the president and the first lady, Michelle Obama, stand outside the White House South Lawn and await their arrival. Can I just say that the first lady looked absolutely stunning. She was wearing a silver sequin cream-colored gown. This really looked like a royal event. After the Prime Minister and his wife arrived, it was time for the ceremony to begin. While this lavish party was getting underway, the Salahis were getting ready to strike. Here's audio from Bravo's Real Housewives of D.C. The Salahis limo approached the White House gate. Here's how NBC anchor Brian Williams remembers it. 
we were several cars in line and we were just parked. We couldn't figure out what the holdup was. And it turns out an SUV was trying to turn around and get out. Actually, the first ring of Secret Service security had worked. The vehicle belonging to this couple, the one they were being driven in, was turned away. Their attempt to pull straight into the White House failed, but that wasn't going to stop them. It was time to go to Plan B. Are we at the southeast gate here? This, ha- this has got to be the gate because I can see them with a, a clipboard or somebody's there. The driver turns around and drops Hello, him off hi. a block Thank away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. The Salahis are now on foot, walking and heading towards the White House pedestrian entrance. They approach the checkpoint where someone with a clipboard asked them for their thank name. Thank you, love. Last name? That's fine. It's hard to hear, but the woman holding the clipboard says that she's not seeing them on the list. So what does the guard do? She instructs them to walk right in and go to the next checkpoint. Thank you, love. Last name? This was a mistake. Mikhail grabs Tariq by the arm and walks past the barriers towards the White House. She looks back at the cameraman who is left behind and gives Tariq a kiss on the lips. Why were they allowed in? Why weren't they just asked to wait outside? My guess is that they looked the part. Why else would they be dressed like this if they weren't going to the gala? Also, this was a big event, even for the White House. The Salahis just took advantage of the chaos at the event. But getting through the first two checkpoints was just the beginning. How long could they possibly pull this off? The couple passed through the metal detector and they were clear. Here's Katie Curry, who was at the event that night. They weren't anything out of the ordinary. In fact, I, they just, gosh, seemed like they belonged there. And just like that, the Salahis successfully crashed the most secure party ever. Mr. and Mrs. Salahi. They stopped at an East Room reception. Then, where others presented a formal name card supplied by the White House, the Salahis managed to join the receiving line without one, entering the Blue Room and eventually shaking hands with the president himself. I don't know if you remember when this happened, but we're pretty lucky that this was just a stupid publicity stunt. This could have been anyone. Imagine if a terrorist tried to pull this off. Both the president, vice president, and speaker of the house were in attendance. If things went south, Kiefer Sutherland would be president as the designated survivor. I'm kidding, of course, but I mean, come on. So what was the fallout for this? Here's the reaction from the Secret Service. It's a unforgivable and indefensible mistake that we've made. This is our fault and our fault alone. There's there's no other people to blame here. You know, look at me and blame me. This is our fault. Here's Brian Williams again. We encountered them during cocktails. I remember saying to my wife, that's them. That's the couple we saw on the street with the makeup detail and the camera following them. You know me. I had to know more about these people. So I tracked down Tariq Salahi. That's after the break. Hey, Tariq, can you hear me? I can. All right, to be completely honest, I've never watched The Real Housewives of D.C. or any of the Housewives series. It's true. I've never watched The Real Housewives franchise. It's not my cup of tea. All right, we have to talk about it. The White House State Dinner. What was that like? Well, what most people don't know is that we walked in with a very large film crew from NBC's company Bravo uh, Television. I think most people thought, hey, you guys just, you know, walked in or you snuck in and and uh, you're trying to be on the show. The film crew size with the, with producers, sound people, and the cameras was nearly 15 to 20 people. We walked in. They had a permit to film. Uh, obviously, we got announced. We were being announced from a guest list when they said our names to go across the red carpet. Did we really crash? No. Was it made to be like that on TV? Of course. It was great ratings for the show. It was one of the highest rated freshman series in the history of Bravo T- television. Yeah. It was, it was fun. We had, I had a blast doing it. So back in the day, I used to know this guy named Juan, and we used to crash parties together. But I was scared to death. But Juan, he just fit right in. He actually made the parties better. And I feel like you and your wife kind of 
fit that White House state dinner, right? We, look, we had a blast. The truth is, when we, were, when we walked in, you know, we were making friends right away with a number of people, some people that we already knew. I mean, I'd already known Obama through other things that my winery was the official wine for Block the Vote, which is with the DNC. And so a lot of the faces were familiar faces. And then, of course, things just, you know, as the party does, we, it just turned into the life of the party. and We're taking pictures with everyone. And they wanted pictures with us. We were just having a, a blast, and everybody loved it. I only have fond memories, to be honest. It's, it was a good time. So were you guys just getting cold stares the whole night? Oh, still the opposite. I mean, everybody knew something was up because the cameras were on us. They were following us to the White House, and then, and then while we were there, plus, Bravo had to get a film from it to film at the White House, which was approved by the government. By the, by the government, by the White House. So everybody knew we were going to be there. There, there. there was never a question about that. Oh, but there were many questions about it. It was, it was exciting. It was fun. I don't have any regrets at all. Everyone wanted to be part of it. Everyone was trying to get in the photos and, or be on camera. And at the time, Vice President Biden, you know, he was just full of life and full of charisma. And, you know, we were talking about the winery and so he was just really outgoing and a great smile and full of life. And he was the one who actually saying, hey, let's take pictures and OK, let's get some without you. Let's get some with you. Let's get some with these people. You know, he was sort of leading it. It was fantastic. Here's President-elect Joe Biden, who was vice president at the time. I didn't realize I'd get so much coverage because of a couple that walked up that uh, acted like they were my old buddies. And uh, I thought, well, these guys are just staples in the, you know, in Washington society. The event went off without a hitch. It wasn't until the next day that someone realized that the Salahis weren't invited guests. So who got wind that you guys weren't supposed to be there? A local reporter here in Washington, D.C. that was following the cast of The Real Housewives. They were reporting the story that we had we had uh, party crashed the White House. At the end of the day, you know, the show aired, and and I remember uh, Matt Lauer and everybody at NBC saying, you know, this is going to be the hottest ticket in town. And So why was it just a single season? It was a single season because of that, because of, of what happened with the White House, because the Secret Service got involved, not only with, with investigating, but they were investigating even the production company. You know, what did they know? What were they saying to each other? There were some there were some things I can't discuss still to this day, but there were there were some things that happened that made it a challenge for the production company and for Bravo to continue moving forward. And it, it had to be it had to be nicked at that time. It, It was uh, it was an exciting time, but yeah, when when the feds and the Secret Service are taking away all the tapes from Bravo and NBC, you know there's going to be there's issues. There were more issues than more people were aware of. Give us a sense of what your life has been like the last ten or eleven years. Yeah, you know, um, you know, we were one of the first wineries in Virginia. Tariq Salahi took over the family vineyard. In addition to producing wine, Salahi splits his time operating a cruise line. So we're keeping both companies going over the last 10 years, both the winery and the cruise industry. And we've released two new wines through the winery called the Real House Winos. The white wine of Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay. And the red wine of the Cabernet Sauvignon. We are developing a beer, developing two beers for the future that we own the names on. One is called the White House Crashers Beer. And then the other one is called Gold Digging Blonde Ale. You know, a half a Weizen style beer, you know, 100% wheat beer. Crashing the White House wasn't enough. Tariq Salahi's next big move was to crash the governor's mansion. In 2012, Salahi ran for governor of Virginia. You know, one of the things that surprised me while researching you was that you actually ran for governor in Virginia. The guy that was running, and uh, he was attacking our, my industry, the wine industry. And then he started attacking me personally, and it made it personal. And I said, you know, this guy would be the worst guy to be our leader in Virginia. I said, I've got to throw my hat in, and if nothing else, just to crash the vote. Literally, crash the vote, take away votes from him, 
to make sure the other guy wins. And his plan worked. Sort of. His adversary, Ken Cuscinelli, lost the governor's race by 56,000 votes. But Salahi had nothing to do with it. Do you ever think you're going to get back into politics? It, it was a blast meeting people throughout the state, being on the road. Let me tell you, that was such a great experience traveling. You know, we put 150,000 miles on that car just over a year, driving all around the state of Virginia in the smallest corners, the big cities. But, you know, after the thrill of the White House state dinner fizzled and the real housewives of D.C. got canceled, Tariq and Mikkel's life started to fall apart. Once the TV crews stopped following them around, life must have seemed a little dull. But that all changed one ordinary Tuesday morning. According to Tariq Salahi, his wife, Mikhail, left the house around 11 a.m. to go get her hair done. But she never made it to the salon. He waited and waited, but no word from Mikhail. Then later on that night, he says he received a call from a strange Oregon number. It was Mikhail, but she didn't sound like herself. Tariq reported her missing to the police and then sent out this frantic tweet. It read, in all caps, quote, Alert! Urgent! Mikhail Salahi missing! Retweet! Unquote. When I asked Tariq about the incident, a few details changed. Instead of Mikhail going to the salon, in this version of the story, she was going to her mom's house. At the time, she just said she was heading to her mom's house. So when, you know, her mom called me asking me where she was, I said, well, she told me she was at to see you. You know, you know that's, that doesn't add up. And any human being would be worried about their wife or a loved one if they were meant to be someplace. And then the other people say, oh, no, they never made it. When you can't reach them and you don't know what's going on, and it had been you know, 24 hours now. Even the FBI got involved. It turns out that Mikhail wasn't kidnapped. She left him. It turns out that you and your wife ended up splitting up. Can you talk to us about that? I found out there was that she was seeing one of my uh, groomsmen from my wedding. She ran off with one of the groomsmen? Damn, that's cold. I bet you'll never guess who it was. Neil Schoen. Does that name ring a bell? It was the founder of Journey. Yep, Neil Sean, the lead guitarist of Journey. You know, after after we had found out she'd done what she did, and you know, she went off, and and we had found out through the court proceedings, you know, had been going on for a while, and I didn't realize that Neil was one of your groomsmen. Yeah, that seems really raw. I mean, I just thought that maybe you guys knew each other in passing, uh, but it sounds like you guys were friends at some point, right? Yeah, of course. I considered all the guys. From Journey's friends, they'd been to the winery many times, stayed at our home there at, at Oasis. I consider them friends. We'd even toured with, uh, with Journey at one point. I would imagine that it's safe to say that you were blindsided, right? That you didn't see this coming? Oh, yeah, completely. Didn't, at, at, completely blindsided. Would have never guessed that in a million years. So it, was, it wasn't just a shock to me. I think it was a shock to... All of our mutual friends, loved ones, and family members, no one would have ever had guessed. And he was pretty nasty about it, too, right? Not only did he do this, but but then he actually sent you nasty messages, right? Is that true, or is that rumor? It's pretty well known what he had sent me, and it was pretty, it was pretty rough. According to Salahi, the Journey guitarist confirmed the affair by sending Tariq a photo of his junk. Everybody has their own ways of how they roll, and... That's just the way that he rolled. When they sent that picture, both the attorney and the FBI were there, and were like, look at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that one was a scroller. <laughs> well, it was interesting, and oh, so the attorney took it and ended it into court record. Oh, man, well, there you go. Tariq says that his life is quieter these days. He even crashed another wedding, this time his own. You know, it's been a blessing for me. I got to meet my my wife now, Lisa, and I couldn't be happier and, and very grateful for the way things turned out in life. It's good to have a sense of humor about these things, right? You got to. You know, you, you've got to, you got to make fun of yourself and you've got, you can't take life so seriously. And I think that's the most important thing is not taking life so seriously, enjoying every day as it comes and being thankful, grateful every day you wake up and you're healthy and... And you can enjoy uh, enjoy life. 
Well, it's been really great to talk to you, man. All right. Well, thanks for having me on your show. Dude, thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Here. Bye. Bye-bye. When we come back, it's your turn. I'm going to play some of your party crashing stories. That's after the break. Our first listener submitted party crash story comes from Kim, a traveling nurse who is saving lives on a daily basis. And in her spare time, she's also the host of the People Are Wild podcast. I was hanging out with a couple of my friends and I had noticed while we were hanging out in the backyard that there seemed to be like some commotion and music coming from somewhere nearby, but wasn't really able to pinpoint it. And it turned out that this family up the road and kind of the next street over was having a wedding reception in their backyard. So wasn't really friends with these people. I certainly didn't know them. And of course, we got in our heads. Well, let's crash their wedding reception. Why not? Right. I was not dressed for a wedding reception by any means. I had on Converse jeans and a shirt that probably had some sort of mathematical pun on it. My friends were not at all really dressed for a wedding reception either. One of them, a little bit more so, had at least dark pants on. Nobody was wearing a button down. Nobody was certainly wearing a skirt or a dress. And well, we kind of looked like we would stick out. But we figured, you know what, if you go in with confidence, never know it'll happen, right? I think we got there actually at around like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. And the party had been going on for a good amount of time at this point. Now with the party in full swing, music is pumping, uh, something amazing was about to happen that night. There was an open bar and an open bar leads to great decisions. Always, 100%, no regrets. Uh, Sure enough, yours truly found her way to the dance floor and was tearing up the dance floor. I mean, full on, like bringing people out onto the dance floor, having a good time. The music was going, interacting with the DJ. Yes, yes. Hands in the air. I could feel it. You could feel it. Let's get down and boogie. All right. Now, at one point coming back to get my drink, I got sort of accosted by the maid of honor and she zeroed in knowing full well I was not there as an invited guest. And she said to me, I know that we did not invite you. However, I like how much you've been bringing people on the dance floor. People are having a good time. And because of that, you are totally staying. Have a piece of cake. Have some fun. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep having a good time. It's so much fun to have you and your friends here. I was like, holy crap. Not only did we crash a wedding reception, but we actually were essentially invited during the reception to stay. I ended up having the maid of honor ask me, I guess, a couple days later, like, could I come to another party? And actually, I was out of town. So I was like, no, but thank you for thinking of me. And how did you get my number? Our next story comes from a longtime listener named Brian Spencer. Brian has been a huge supporter of the show. Hi, my name is Brian. I live in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, but I grew up in the small town of Greensburg, Indiana. It was a great small town. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to do there. About the time I was a sophomore, a buddy of mine's like, hey, we're going to go to a wedding reception. I'm like, were we invited? He's like, no, but we're just going to go anyways. I'm like, okay, let's go. <laughs> so we get out there and there's a big open building. I was nervous. I I'd never been to a wedding where I wasn't invited. So we walk up, get up there, and there's just wall-to-wall people. I mean, it's just packed in there. Get it. We just had a good time and hung out and enjoyed ourselves. And so I left the night, got home, and told my mom what, what we had done. After that, we would go probably a couple times, maybe three or four times a year. I probably crashed about eight to ten weddings. And nobody ever said a thing. You just showed up and hung out and had a good time and met people from other schools around the area. And, and last time I was there, I was it was for a friend's wedding, and I was actually invited. And it kind of took the luster away when you're invited to a wedding and you're not crashing it anymore. But Back in the early 2000s, I crashed a Sony Pictures party at the Sundance Film Festival. 
Our last story comes from my friend and co-worker, Dave B. Dave B and I have worked together for several years now. He's one of my creative mentors, my master Yoda, if you will. But back before we ever met, Dave B was a young filmmaker trying to get discovered in Hollywood. He and his filmmaking buddies entered their short film at Sundance. Well, it wasn't the main Sundance Festival. It was a much smaller side festival. There's like this crazy sort of hierarchy there. And so you really understand that pecking order pretty quickly and you're treated kind of differently where you go. One of the guys in his group got invited to a big Sony picture party. And he's like, oh, you guys should come along. And, and you know, he'd get us in somehow. And we didn't really know how he'd get us in. And we didn't... <laughs> You know, know if we really belonged in the party, but we were up for it. We wanted to meet people. We wanted to meet celebrities and stuff. So uh, we went out and, you know, at the venue of the place, there was a bouncer and, you know, a velvet rope. And this guy in a booming voice, he just keeps saying, you know, there's only one way into this party. You got to be in this line and you got to have a ticket. If you don't have a ticket and you're not standing in this line, you will not get into this party. And the funny thing was, as you, we were standing out there for a while, you noticed that no, no one who was actually standing in that line holding a ticket got in, but all these people would kind of go up to the, bar, to the bouncer, kind of say something in his ear, and he would let them in. So it was absolutely the opposite uh, of what he kept yelling. But then after we watched this thing play out over and over again, I see my buddy come around the side of the venue, and he's like, hey, come this way, you know? And we sneak around the back, and he's got the kitchen door propped open. And so... We went in uh, through the back, so, you know, Goodfellas style, and come in. And now we're in this, like, real, honest-to-God Hollywood party with, like, celebrities. There's, like, Francis Ford Coppola and Macaulay Culkin and Campbell Scott, all these, all these p- people that you recognize from the movies. And there's gift bags and drinks and everything. And there was this one moment that I remember where Elvis Mitchell the film critic was talking to Francis Ford Coppola. And so I kind of snuck up behind there, really engrossed in the conversation. I sneak, sneak up behind and I open up Elvis Mitchell's uh, backpack and I take the DVD of my short and I you know, jam, sort of jam it in there gently. And he never notices a thing. I zip up the backpack again. And, I, you know, I knew he'd never watch this short that I made, but I just thought it'd be really funny when he opened his bag that night and, and, and saw it there. But it was really cool to be like a little person in this big person uh, Hollywood world. By the way, today's episode has been sitting in my hard drive for two and a half years now. I just didn't know what to do with it. My intention was to learn how to crash a party and then actually crash a party and record it so that you could hear it. But then COVID happened. So I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any party crasher stories that you want to send me, record a voice memo, send it to me at Javier at pretendradio.org. And I'll find a way to play it. I'd love to hear it. Creative Babble.